Our first muscle is going to be the frontalis, which is denoted here by the number one. It is actually connected to this muscle here, which is at number 10 on this model. And together we call this the occipitofrontalis. Um, another name for it is the epicranius. But let's go ahead and just focus on this first portion right here. So the origin is going to be the cranial aponeurosis, and that's what this little broad sheet of connective tissue is. Um, that's also why you may see some sources list this as one muscle, um, and really it's the bellies of these two muscles that are connected to this middle connective sheet called the cranial aponeurosis. So for the frontalis, the origin is the cranial aponeurosis, and the insertion is going to be the skin of the eyelids. So let's remember our rule. The origin is the less movable portion. The insertion is the more movable portion, which means, generally speaking, the insertion point will move toward the origin. So when this frontalis muscle contracts, that means we will raise the eyebrows. Now let's look at the occipitalis or the occipital belly of the occipitofrontalis muscle. The origin is going to be the occipital bone and the insertion is going to be the cranial aponeurosis. So again, if the insertion moves toward the origin when this muscle contracts, that means that this muscle will retract or move the scalp backwards posteriorly. Next we have the orbicularis oculi and this is the left one specifically. Now before I move on, tell me what is the shape of this muscle? Hopefully you just said circular, you would be correct. Now form follows function. What is the function of a circular shaped muscle? Well it is to open and close that part of the body. Sphincters, for instance, are another type of circular muscle. So here on this orbicularis oculi, it um, originates around the orbit. It will insert around where the eyelids are. And whenever this muscle contracts, it is going to cause the eye to close. And we use this when we do things like blinking and squinting as well. Next, we have the orbicularis oris. Now, these two muscles here have that orbicularis name in them, but we can distinguish them because of that second part. Oculi reminds us of the eye, and oris sounds like that word oral. So if you focus on that second word, you won't get those mixed up. It is a circular muscle that surrounds the mouth or the lips. Okay, so up here it's gonna be right by the maxilla, down here it'll be by the mandible, and because that circular muscle surrounds the lips, that is going to cause our lips to compress or purse together when it contracts. Okay, now let's look at this one right here, denoted by the number five on this model. This one is called the zygomaticus major. It originates on the zygomatic bone or the zygoma. And if you recall from the skeletal system, that is what we call our cheek bone. And it will insert at the corner of the mouth. So if the insertion moves toward the origin when this muscle contracts, what do you think that's going to do? That's going to draw the corner of the mouth upwards into a smile. So I like to call the zygomaticus major the smile muscle, and it's my personal opinion that if you can come up with little nicknames for the actions, it will really help you remember all these little bits of the muscles a lot easier. I brought my little $5 skull because I thought that would make some of these a little bit easier to tie to the skeletal system. So let's look at this next muscle here. This one right here is called the masseter muscle. Now the masseter sounds a lot like the word mastication, which, which means to chew, which is why I like to call this muscle the chewing muscle. Its origin is going to be the zygomatic arch. So if we look here, remember this is all a part of the temporal bone, this little portion that comes out like this, that is called the zygomatic arch. So that is the origin. 
the insertion is going to be the ramus of the mandible, which is this portion right here. It's basically this, this flat portion. And when the origin moves toward the insertion, we are going to elevate the jaw or elevate the mandible. So you can see why this is called the chewing muscle. Now let's look at another muscle in this area. It's number eight on this model, and this is called the temporalis. Now, a couple of nice things. One, remember that the bone here is called the temporal bone. So remember, we're looking at the right side of the skull here. Here we're looking at the left. That's just a friendly reminder to always mind your rights and lefts, especially on an exam. So here, this will be the left temporalis. The origin is the temporal bone, and the insertion is actually going to be the coronoid process of the mandible. Now you can't really see that here, which is why I have my handy dandy $5 skull. So here you have the right coronoid process. Um, remember we have two projections here. The anterior one is the coronoid process. So the temporalis is basically going to come down like this. So again, if the insertion moves toward the origin, what is that going to do? Well, this one, very similar to the masseter muscle, is going to elevate the mandible. The minor difference is that um, these two will both elevate the mandible, but the masseter is going to elevate and protract, so that's a little bit of an anterior movement, and the temporalis is going to elevate and retract, and remember that's a posterior movement. But this one has a very similar action to this one right here. Let's recap a couple of strategies we've used to name muscles. So number one, some of them are named due to their shape. Number two, some of them are named due to where they are in the body. Number three, some of them are named for skeletal features. And Another one is name due to what it attaches to. So now let's look at right here, number 11. This is the sternocleidomastoid. The sternocleidomastoid is named as such because it is attached to the sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So sternocleidomastoid. Now, let's do a little exercise here. I've said several times by now that the insertion is going to move towards the origin. If I told you that one of the actions was unilateral flexion, meaning if just this one flexed, okay, where do you think the origin would be? Would the origin be somewhere here or would it be up here? Hopefully you're saying the origin would be here because the insertion needs to move towards the origin in order to cause the neck to flex. Unilateral flexion means uni, one, lateral to the side. So that would be like trying to put your left ear to your left shoulder. So go ahead and do that right now. That is your left sternocleidomastoid performing its action. We have one on the right side as well. It's just tucked away on this model. The origin is going to be the sternum and the clavicle. And the insertion point is going to be the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And I'm going to flip this over and show this side by side with my skull. Here I'm showing you the right sternocleidomastoid, and I thought this would be best to show you the insertion point, which is going to be the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Now here again on my little handy dandy $5 skull, remember those mastoid processes are these little things right here. All right, let's look at this uh, creepy view. I don't know, the eyes look extra weird to me in this view. I should, should have gotten some like Barbie sunglasses for it or something. But anyways, I digress. Okay, so here's the left sternocleidomastoid. Here's the right one. Now, a couple other movements. If both of these flex at the same time, it will cause your head to come like this. So that would just be flexion 
at the neck. And if you're one of my students, you'll know I call this the double chin special because that's what happens when these do flex at the same time. Something else that's interesting, so a moment I told you um, that if uh, you have unilateral flexion, what that means is that this can cause the head to laterally flex like that, so it'd be like ear to shoulder. But something else that can happen is that if one of these contracts, it can cause rotation to the opposite side. And if we have a spasm of that muscle that causes a rotation to one side or the other, depending on, on what side is spasming, that's actually associated with something called torticollis or wry neck. And that's when there's kind of this like little head tilt going on. So those are the sternocleidomastoids. Hey you, yeah, you right there. Why don't you hit like and subscribe? And don't forget to hit that bell icon to receive notifications every time I release a new video. Thanks for your support and I'll see you in the lab.